Good evening, good morning, wherever you are. It's great to have all of you in this uh, TCI Walmart Foundation launch of the FPO Hub as part of the TCI Center of Excellence. Uh, my name is Prabhu Pingali. I'm a professor of applied economics at Cornell University and also the director of the Tata Cornell Institute. Let me start by giving you a brief introduction to the Tata Cornell Institute, TCI, and talk a little bit about the FBO Hub uh, as an introduction. Um, the Tata Cornell Institute is based in the College of Agriculture at Cornell University. And, and our mission is to understand why uh, India continues to see such high levels of rural poverty, malnutrition, and food insecurity, despite being an emerging economy, despite having such a large urban middle-class population and having really high overall economic growth rates. So this uh, kind of this, um, this continuum between growth that's taking place in the overall economy and the stagnation in the rural sector and persistence of rural poverty is an area that many of us have been thinking about. And it's an area that TCI has really taken up as its core mission and core research agenda. And, and over the last decade, we've been focusing a lot of our efforts on looking at agriculture and agriculture, productivity growth, diversification of agriculture systems towards more nutritious food systems as an opportunity to address some of the problems of malnutrition in India. And also looking at agriculture as an engine of growth for the rural poor. And and that engine of growth then um, connects the rural poor to the rising urban demand for food, especially the rising urban demand for uh, fruits, vegetables, livestock products, et cetera. And we see that as, as you connect rural India to that rising urban demand for food, that creates new opportunities for income growth for small farms across the country, especially in the lagging regions of India. So that's where our interest has been. And that's how we've come to this interest in farmer producer organizations, because we realize that small farms by themselves don't have the scale to be able to benefit from the, the urban demand and connecting into the urban food value chains. And so one needs to look at aggregation models of different types that farmers can connect into and then create the scale that's needed to be able to participate in the market systems. And there's been various experiences uh, with aggregation models in India and everywhere else in the world there's been experiences with cooperatives, collectives, et cetera. And most of these experiences have had variable success rates and, and there've been several problems associated with them. And over time, there's been a move towards making uh, these aggregation models themselves much more responsive to market signals. And, and that led to farmer producer organizations coming up. And, and our interest in aggregation models then led us also to look at farmer producer organizations as one of the key mechanisms by which one can create aggregation across smallholders and create growth opportunities for smallholders by connecting to urban food value chains. And we've been delighted uh, as we moved along this path to partner with the Walmart Foundation and, and work together to see 
how one can can examine the viability and the efficacy of farmer producer organizations as a way for farmers to connect into markets. And we've, um, we've looked at ways in which we can learn from the experience of Walmart Foundation, the Walmart Foundation partners in India and across the developing world and learn from those lessons and see how one can then apply those lessons to FBO promotion within India. Uh, as a part of that work with the Walmart Foundation, we've established uh, an FBO hub. Uh, the FBO hub is actually part of the TCI Center of Excellence, which is based in Delhi. Our Center of Excellence has been a major focal point for providing information, data, and policy analysis around the broader areas of agriculture and nutrition in India. And the FBO hub fits very well within this center of excellence and, and becomes a one-stop shop on all data and all research related to FBOs with a particular focus on India. Our research um, brings together uh, uh, research that's done not just at TCI, but also um, research on FBOs that's been done around the world and valuable lessons that have come from these experiences that uh, we can learn from and, and use in our own work in India. And the data dashboard that will be presented today has some very, very unique uh, data that's brought together in one place that would be extremely useful for uh, promoters of FBOs, stakeholders of FBOs, uh, such as um, uh, government agencies. Um, some of the government agencies are here on the panel, especially NABAD, um, but also for NGO uh, partners in India and civil society organizations and researchers, of course. And so we see the, the hub as being uh, a one-stop shop for, the, for people who promote and work with FBOs. And, and I think this would be an important resource going forward. Um, let me take this opportunity to uh, thank the Walmart Foundation for supporting our work and to introduce Julie Gerke, who is the Vice President for Programs of Walmart.org and invite her to make her opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Pingali. I'm really honored to be here. Um, it feels like this is a day we've been looking forward to for a while. Um, and so I wanna start by thanking Tata Cornell Institute um, and all the work they've done. Very candidly, three years ago, when we launched our work on and investments um, on FPOs in India, this was a bit of a dream. Um, we announced a five-year, $25 million commitment to improving farmer livelihoods. Um, and we really hoped to be surrounded by partners and learning from each other about what works. Um, and so we're really grateful for the work the Center of Excellence has done and the creation of the, um, the hub and what it will produce. The focus of our funding really has been as we stepped back and looked at the role we could play in livelihoods, we also became a believer in FPOs, farmer producing organizations as a mechanism that could bring unique value as they were strengthened um, and really thinking about the role they can play in creating access to formal markets um, for smallholders, thinking about the role we can play in helping those FPOs develop good governance, good business practices, get digital access to logistics, prices, all of the things that can come with digital transparency, um, access to high quality inputs, 
And really the idea that by coming together as smallholders, um, there could be more power to produce better livelihoods for all. We're really proud of where we are. Um, and that is because of the partnerships with our grantees. So we've invested about $20 million to this point in our $25 million commitment. Um, we have over 10 grantees doing work and have reached over 140,000 farmers. One of the things we're really excited about is over 80,000 of those are women. Um, and really the role that women smallholders can play as we build value and are grateful for the thoughtful way in which our partners are thinking about gender in this work. Um, they've connected FPOs with legitimate buyers, they've increased quality, um, but I also think we've seen them play a special role um, since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Um, as everybody knows, it's been devastating in rural communities, um, and it's had a disproportionate effect on women who have had to carry a, additional household chores um, and really been um, hit by increased food insecurity. And from the start of the outbreak, we've been impressed with seeing um, our NGO partners pivot. Um, they have helped bring knowledge of what's going on. They've brought PPE. Um, they've really recognized that coming through the pandemic while continuing to plant and have um, good production um, was essential to their work. And so I want to specifically thank them for the work they've done helping with kitchen gardens and all these things that may not have been a part of their original plan, but was necessary to build resiliency um, in this time. And we're grateful, particularly because we think it reflects being close to the community, having the trust of FPOs and smallholder farmers, um, and is the kind of resiliency that this can create. Um, today, we're really excited to participate in the launch. As Dr. Pangali talked about, we think the, the Farmer Producer Hub can be a tremendous resource for all of us. Um, by having the first in its kind database of FPOs across India, which you're gonna hear more about in a minute, um, by bringing the best research, the best practitioners together so that we accelerate our learning, so that we see from each of you what your learning and finding is working, um, we will strengthen the system and bring to reality the vision that Dr. Pankali laid out um, where the formal markets um, really can play a developmental role in livelihoods for rural farmers. Um, and so I want to quickly get onto the program um, because I'm surrounded with a number of really smart people, um, but I'm grateful to be here and grateful for all the work that you all are doing. So with that, I will turn it back over um, so that we can learn more about this work. Matthew, I think you're going to share about the, the project that you've been working on. I was just waiting for Prabhu, just one second. Looks like there's some connectivity problems. So it's got yeah. on and off. Yeah, I think so. So I, I think, Dan, we can move ahead. Okay, will you? Good morning and good evening. I'm Matthew Ibram, the Assistant Director of the Tata O'Connell Institute. 
and the co-PI of the FPO project. At the start of the project, we set out to take stock of the global evidence of aggregation models and how they enable smallholder commercialization. The intent of the endeavor was to situate the India and Mexico project in the global context. Here, I will give a brief overview of the major findings of this study. The importance of smallholder aggregation comes from the fact that a majority of the world's farms are small and marginal in size and houses a majority of the world's poor and food insecure. They face problems with access to productive resources, inputs and markets, influencing their viability, necessitating a need to move out of agriculture or move up by rectifying these challenges. Aggregation models to rectify smallholder disadvantages is not a new concept. In erstwhile socialist countries, in the absence of property rights, collectivization was a method of aggregation. In other developing countries, cooperatives were introduced by colonial powers, retained beyond the 1950s, and met with disparate levels of success through the years. In the past two decades, there has been a renewed interest in aggregation models in the wake of structural change and changing consumer demand. In this study, to review the global evidence of aggregation models, we screened 1,020 peer-reviewed articles and published books, identified 354 for full text review, and finally selected 233 studies for this research. We also created an annotated bibliography of 85 articles of high relevance, which will be available on our website. The question we posed was, do farmer produce organizations solve smallholder market access problems to enable small farm commercialization? The aim of the research was to assess the taxonomy of aggregation models globally, determine the factors influencing their re-emergence, look at the evidence of commercialization and welfare gains, and identify the research gaps in the understanding of aggregation models. I will briefly present five major takeaways of the systematic review. The first finding was regarding the taxonomy of aggregation models. About 79% of the reviewed papers were published in the last 11 years. 53 were published in the last six years. In fact, only 3% of the papers in our search were published before 2000, pointing to a recent increased focus on aggregation models. Cooperatives were still the most prevalent aggregation format globally, followed by farmer producer organizations, making up 31% of the study. In the literature, we found informal aggregation models to be relatively small. We found that in many countries, different aggregation models coexisted. For example, in India, we find cooperatives, producer companies, informal farmer groups, and similarly, in other countries, there is a coexistence of these models. The second finding was regarding the re-emergence of aggregation models. Aggregation models are not new to the agricultural sector in developing countries, but we see its re-emergence in two distinct strands. The first strand is in erstwhile socialist economies, especially China, Vietnam, Ethiopia, that had collectivization. In the decades following decollectivization, we see an emergence of newer aggregation models when farmer control of produce or tenure security emerged. In Mexico, we see cooperatives and farmer groups emerging when ownership rights and Hedo transformations took place. The second strand is in countries that traditionally had cooperatives, both during pre- and post-independence periods. We see newer formats stated to be more adept at leveraging new market opportunities being promoted where traditional cooperatives failed. We see this in India, Kenya, Uganda, in South Africa, etc. In Latin American countries, the second wave of aggregation models began in the mid-1990s, while in most other countries in Asia and Africa, they began in the early 2000s, but picked up in the last decade. The third major finding was regarding diversification and market orientation. A significant number of farmer aggregation models undertook the production and marketing of higher value crops such as horticulture crops, dairy, livestock, and cash crops such as tea and coffee. 
Cereal production as a focus of these groups was in proportion much fewer. Crop choice was also influenced by the market orientation of the crop in different countries. On the right graph, we see the depiction of the domestic and international orientation of groups. In countries such as Mexico, Nicaragua, Uganda, Vietnam, and South Africa, a majority of the groups had an external orientation towards the international markets and, and specialized in export-oriented crops such as tea, coffee, and specialized fruit products. We see the diversity of uh, production in these aggregation models in these countries to be relatively lower. Countries with higher domestic market orientation showed aggregation models growing a higher diversity of crops, horticulture crops, oil seeds, legumes, and dairy. Horticulture crops was the focus of many producer groups in India, China, and South Africa. Dairy producer groups that were successful under the cooperative mo movement also figured prominently in Kenya and Ethiopia in newer formats. The reviewed studies overwhelmingly showed that aggregation models enable commercialization and household level welfare by improving access to product and factor markets. A majority of the studies reported increased access to factor markets such as extension services, credit, information, inputs, and technical assistance. Fewer studies showed provisioning of marketing services. When we break down the variable of marketing services, we see a majority of the studies uh, reported to have joint marketing services, and relatively fewer groups had contracting services. We also look at the evidence of benefits based on the robustness of the studies. Qualitative studies looked at improved technical efficiency, access to markets and inputs, and social factors such as women empowerment and social capital building as variables of interest. Very few reported a decrease in these variables and almost all studies showed an increase. A majority of the studies were dual or single case studies. We had identified only a few multiple case study research. Evidence from quantitative studies showed an increase in income, productivity, and other profit measures of smallholder agriculture households. Some studies uh, showed a decrease in price, yield, and marketing performance. Some of the studies were based on panel data estimations, while others were largely quasi-experimental studies. Our last finding from the review concerned the apparent gaps and limitations in the existing literature. The first limitation was, due to the nature of the research topic itself, all the studies that appeared in articles and books published were cases of success. Unsuccessful aggregation initiatives are harder to track ex post, so this limitation is understandable but needs to be rectified. Second. A majority of both quantitative and qualitative studies looked at aggregation models at a single point in time. The absence of even basic data over time makes it harder to track aggregation models and assess pertinent questions of organizational sustainability and attrition levels. There is a need for the development of a data ecosystem that have basic and detailed information that will allow us to study FPOs over time. The third limitation was that the focus of performance was largely at the household level, access, incomes, yields, etc. Assessing an aggregation model's organizational and financial performance was largely missing. There is a need for both metrics and methodology to answer questions of organizational viability. The fourth, the fourth and very important limitation was the gender focus. Women's participation in aggregation models is critical, but very few studies explicitly looked at the role of gendered FPOs or about how to improve women's participation in aggregation models. This could be potentially due to the existence of relatively fewer women-led aggregation models. There is a critical need to promote more gendered FPOs and also systematically study them. These were the major findings of this uh, systematic review. Thank you for your attention. The full systematic review is complete and ready for peer review. 
we will have it as a working paper on our website along with supplementary material. Also soon available is the annotated bibliography of highly relevant studies and their findings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew, for your presentation. Thank you, Matthew, for your presentation. Let's move now to uh, Tanu Chabla for his presentation of the FPO Hub. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, I will just ask Dan to start the video. Tanuj, I think you are on mute. Um, th there is audio on the presentation. So Dan, I'll just take over and uh, share my own slideshow, if that's OK. OK, Tanuj, go ahead. The government of India, in a press release in March of this year, launched an ambitious central sector scheme of formation and promotion of 10,000. Dan, you can pause that, maybe? Farmers income. This includes professional handholding of FPOs and Thank you so much. So um, hello everyone and welcome to the launch of the TCI Center of Excellence Database for Indian Farmer Producer Organizations or the TCI FPO Database as we call it here at our office. My name is Tanu Chavla and I'm an associate researcher at the TCI's New Delhi office. I shall be introducing the database to you as its product owner and having spent the last 18 months building this technology tool that attempts to address the small farmer commercialization and aggregation model challenges in the Indian context from an organizational standpoint. Starting this journey, um, let's begin with something very recent. The government of India in a press release in March of this year launched an ambitious central sector scheme of formation and promotion of 10,000 FPOs as one of the means to double farmer income. This included professional handholding of FPOs in certain states and equity grants uh, to eligible FPOs for up to 15 lakh rupees at around 2,000 rupees per farmer, which comes to an acceptable membership size of around 750 members of farmers per FPO. Another response in Parliament added that there will be credit guarantee facility of up to rupees 2 crore rupees per FPO from eligible lending institutions, ensuring institutional credit facility to FPOs alongside provision for skill building. Additionally, the press release states that so far over 2,200 FPOs have been set up just in the year 2020-2021, and 32 of these FPOs are made under this new central scheme through one of the government-aided promoting agencies like NABARD, SFAC, or the NRLM. Impressive it is, uh, though despite these huge efforts around FPO formation and these budget announcements, we still do not know how many FPOs exist in the Indian landscape. So here we have tried to capture three different sources to take stock of the FPO landscape and were able to identify some disparity in the numbers. The National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development being an apex development finance institution fully owned and by the government of India has so far supported over 4,000 FPO formation and put the total FPO count in India at over 6,000. The number goes down by a thousand if we look at the SFAC web publishing that were updated at the end of 2020. And during the same year, another report by Azim Prem University mentions that the number of FPOs in India is at 7,374 to be precise. Additionally, through our own research on a financial data platform and the Ministry of Corporate Affairs records, we find that over 16,000 companies are registered in India with criteria that match producer companies and are registered as agribusiness setups. Hence the fundamental question that how many FPOs are there in India? And this arises because there is no single source of FPO or FPO related information leading up to the disparity on not just the number of FPOs in existence, but also on their survival as business entities. So as we set on to answer the questions on how many FPOs truly exist and are functionally contributing to the FPO landscape in the country, we find that the current data ecosystem around FPOs pose some even unique challenges. 
we did not truly know for how many of these existing FPOs were active as many weren't regularly updating their annual financial status or their active compliance status was unknown. And due to the very many data sources with fragmented data codes and formats that came from different organizations, assigning it to the disaggregated data and the limited documentary evidence, it became quite difficult to answer even the basic questions around the FPO landscape in the country. This is further added on by the data specific challenges that include non-uniform data language and difficult access to even basic financials of producer companies, bringing us to a much larger question that in the absence of aggregated unified information, can there really be a robust FPO promotion ecosystem in the country? So continuing further on a quest, we now hedge over and look into the methodology we use to build the FPO database. It's been quite an intensive process, including building new extract, transform, and load pipelines and aggregating information from diverse sources and an endless journey of data cleaning, sweep, and repeat. At our phase one, we started with identifying and scraping information from all publicly available sources like NABARD, SFAC, NRLM, different state agencies, and various NGO publications. This process involved setting up a new code standard and a validation protocol, and we originally started with a bit over 5,500 FPOs and eventually observed that we only just had over 4,400 FPO records, the rest being duplicate entries from various sources. During the phase two, we differentiated these organizations based on three different set criteria, namely their name, the availability of company identification numbers, and the status found from the data sets and labeled them as either producer companies or cooperatives. We then procured key financial indicators for all of the producer companies in our data set from the MCA database through a financial service provider. And as of today, we have basic financial information for a little over 2,500 producer companies and agri-produce related information for 828 cooperatives. And we know it for sure that out of the 1,107 producer companies for which we also have agri-produce related information, over 445 are either already shut or are in the process of shutting down. And the status for the rest is either unknown because they were, we were unable to just map them. Climbing up from the methodology, we shall now go through a live demo of the dashboard and uh, I'll take you through a video slideshow that I've created in the PowerPoint and at the end, I'll show you the website and the web link. So here is the TCI Center of Excellence database for Indian FPOs in its best virtual flesh and accessible to all of you from today on. The web link greets you with the about page that explains a bit about the database and the need for an FPO repository in the country to provide reliable data for better policy design and implementation. Um, it is then followed by the features that we currently offer and plan to offer in the near future an overview of the stakeholder types this platform could cater to and then followed by the team behind the platform. As we click on the dashboard, we see a bird's eye view of the FPO landscape in India with a dynamic interactive map on the left and a summary section on the right, followed by a host of filter selection on tap. We have a total of seven different filter sets here, including one to select active compliant producer companies or to filter through cooperatives in our database. The crop filter provides a selection of 67 crops as 14 different crop categories bundled for an easier selection and assessment. And in between here, we see a floating KPI tab with uh, some view buttons on top. The KPI panel does a dynamic chart for the selected variables through either the filters or the map selection. And one could expand this view and see FPOs established by year, scroll through FPOs and the number of farmers, by the region, by the agencies, and the active compliance status of these FPOs or the filtered set that is currently selected. Clicking on the table view uh, up top, we are able to see a detailed section uh, which shows the name of the companies and also uh, a page nation through which you can scroll. And all of these organizations, their year of establishment, sponsor agencies, farmers, and the crops that they're uh, engaged in and the revenue. Clicking back on the map view, we'll now go through a demo of the drill down as bubble view or heat maps. So let's click on Maharashtra and we see the KPIs adapt dynamically to the selected district. 
we can change that to a heat map and we see Pune has the highest number of FPOs in our data set and we click on Pune. And we see the active compliance information for the FPOs in Pune and uh, the major agency that has been uh, doing work in the district of Pune, that is MSAMB. And also the numbers of number of farmers associated with these 83 FPOs. One could further filter the information from the filter selection on the right pane and drill even further in the swath of information available on our database. And as you can see here, there is an aggregated revenue being displayed on the top right corner, which is 22.8 crore, which is a revenue across 43 FPOs in 2019, while there are 83 FPOs in Pune. That is because we only have primary information for 43 of these FPOs, and some could even be cooperatives here in the selection. And at any given time, uh, if one feels to go back or refresh, hitting the reset button does the job and brings one back to the unfiltered India view of the TCI FPO database. Next up, uh, clicking on the comparisons button takes us to the second major part of the database. Here, one could compare the states across a list of indicators of FPOs. So let us choose Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh for our test example. And we can see the difference in number of FPOs across these two large states and the farmer engagement, along with some crucial financial indicators as we scroll down. So as we see here, the number of FPOs in Maharashtra is just over 1,000, while in Madhya Pradesh, there are 361. And the number of farmers in each of these states is there is a difference of around twice. As we scroll down, we are also able to see the, the sum of paid up capital across FPOs in both of these states, some revenue and their trends, along with active and inactive FPOs, the number of sponsor agencies that are engaged in both of these states, and the list of crops that these FPOs are specifically dealing in. Clicking on the summary tab, we are introduced to the third and the final section of the database that sums up the state-related data across nine different KPI tabs. Selecting a state from the left pane fires up the API engine and displays all the KPIs along with the state summary table on top. So let's select Haryana maybe. And we can see that we have basic financial data here for 60 out of the 71 FPOs in Haryana and we are covering 21 districts so far in the state. One could hear, here, one could uh, further drill down FPOs based on district, sponsor agency, crops, revenue, and we could see FPOs by district, active versus inactive FPOs, the active FPOs versus the total number of FPOs within, within the district, the FPOs with the largest memberships, and the paid up capital by district. So as you can see here that there's one FPO which has a little more than 1,400 members and Karnal seems to have the highest amount of paid up capital per district. And that sort of brings me to the end of the demo of this video. And we believe that there are now a host of tools at our disposal to assess the FPO performance and clearly visualize the FPO promotion experience in India. some information about the upcoming features that we plan on uh, evolving on the TCI database. So while we were working on a host of features around the enormous data we have, uh, some of the future highlights shall be the ability of farmers or FPO owners to claim their FPO and they could possibly use their FPO page as their own landing page for additional public outreach or as a directory homepage with listings for their produce and the area under cultivation. And as we continue to research around the FPO ecosystem in the country, we shall be marking verified FPOs that we have contacted or visited and have validated them using their registered documents during field visits. We also plan on including a semantic search for ease of search or a name search, which could be a natural language name search. So for an example, somebody could search for an active tomato FPO in Himachal and you could just directly type that and we shall produce the result based on a natural language input. And on the gender front, we have the directorship information for over 2,500 producer companies, and that info is currently being mapped with the records of individual directors. We shall soon be able to show the promoter shareholding as distributions between male and female membership. Additionally, registered users at a later stage um, will be able to save their search queries and run multiple search queries together to build a better sense around the data available on our platform. 
And in the future, we also plan on introducing satellite-based map layers to associate geographic features with FPO densities and cropping patterns while also tagging true location of FPOs. And finally, just last month, we were able to secure a new data set from the MCA using certain identifiers that qualify farmer producer companies. And we have been able to identify over 16,800 farmer producer organizations. One can see that this year alone, we have seen over 3,400 FPOs being registered. This information is currently not uploaded on the platform because there is a scrutiny pipeline to validate uh, these organizations as FPOs. And as the information is validated, many of the 14,000 plus, because we already have data for some 2,500 FPOs on the platform. The, so the many, many of the 40,000 plus will make way to our database and will be accessible at the TCI database for Indian FPOs, making us truly the one-stop center for all primary FPO information in India. With this, we come to an end of this brief presentation and we present to you the web link for the TCI's Center for Excellence database for Indian farmer producer organization. And we shall look forward to your reviews and please do write back to us um, if you see something um, airy on the page or spot something that isn't working well. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll hand it over back to the team. Thank you, Tanuj. That was an excellent presentation and really great website, even if I say so. Um, I'm sure it will be really useful to uh, the large group of stakeholders, many of them who are present today as participants, but also people who come to the website in the future. Um, thanks to the entire TCI team in Ithaca and in Delhi for putting this together. Um, before I, when I was going to introduce Matthew, my Zoom link suddenly turned off. So let me uh, quickly introduce Matthew Abraham. He's our associate director uh, based in Ithaca and um, he's been leading the Walmart project um, and uh, he's been doing an enormous job both on bringing the research on FPOs and aggregation models together, but also coordinating the overall uh, FPO website and the launch that happened. And so Matthew, thanks for all your efforts in, in this. Let's, let's now move to the next part of this program, which is to have a panel discussion around FPOs and, and the role of FPOs in, in uh, promoting agricultural productivity growth and creating scale for, for small farm agriculture in India. And we've got an excellent panel here today. Um, I invite um, Julie Gurki back in as a panelist. And in addition to Julie, we've got uh, Mr. Siv Kumar from ITC. We have Mr. Surya Kumar from NABAD, um, and uh, Dr. Padmaja from ICRASAT, and also Satya Acharya from uh, Pradhan. So a, a really great panel um, of individuals who've had uh, decades of experience in farmer producer and promoting farmer producer organizations and and researching farmer producer organizations. So it'll be great to hear from them. I'll first go through and have a round of discussion with the panelists. And then I look at the Q&A and um, uh, pick some questions from the Q&A that can be addressed by the panelists or by the TCI team. Okay, with that, um, let me start with you, Julie, again. Um, and you know, Walmart has played a major role, I think, in, in promoting farmer producer organizations. Walmart Foundation I mean, has played a major role in promoting farmer producer organizations. Um, I think um, a lot of people would like to know, um, as you go through this process, what's the connection between the business side of Walmart versus the foundation activities in promoting FPOs. 
Sure, thanks for the question. So we have a pretty unique model of philanthropy at Walmart Foundation. We are specifically an independent nonprofit that our sole mission is to drive social and environmental impact. But being a foundation that is embedded in and supported by Walmart um, gives us a unique ability to drive change. The insights and the leverage we have by partnering with the company can be tremendous um, and is very different than working at an independent foundation. So starting with Walmart, the company itself really embraces the concept of shared value and believes that through the company, we can solve social and environmental problems. And that in doing that, we'll strengthen the business. Um, that is behind, many of you may have heard about our commitment to be a regenerative company um, and really think about how the company renews systems and makes them stronger. We do this in a couple of ways. First, we really do think at the system level. Um, we want the entire system and to be stronger. We lead that work through the business because we recognize Walmart as a business can do more. And if we make it work for the business, it'll sustain. But we also see that there are things that need to be solved with philanthropy. Um, and we think about that as a complementary asset focused on building stronger systems. And then finally, we, in our kind of model, we collaborate with others. No matter how big Walmart is and our philanthropy, it's not enough. And so we really do see the work with you all, the work with other companies as essential. So taking that philosophy and bringing it to smallholder farmers, um, you think about what are the assets because of the way we work, we only work on issues where we think Walmart has leverage. Even our philanthropy is really tied to issues where Walmart is going to be a part of the solution as a business. And so in smallholders, you think about that we have expertise in things like item specifications. You know, how big should this grow? What quality does the market need? We know that because of our business. Um, we have purchase order. And so the ability to really say, we not only understand the specs, we understand demand. And in some cases, Walmart, not tied to the philanthropy, but is independently looking at ways to buy from smallholders and to think about how they can be a model of off taker um, to the formal market. So those are the things that you think about the business doing. In order for that to work sustainably, we need things like strong FPOs. Um, that aggregation, that strong governance, the good inputs, the market information that says, hey, we're gonna grow high quality and to food safety requirements and all of the pieces that you need in order for formal, formal off-takers, whether they're Walmart or other businesses to do it, we think FBOs can be an incredible part of. And so that's why we're investing in the capacity and capability of FBOs, really thinking about how that comes together. Um, and through our philanthropic investments, others' philanthropic investments, we envision a world where there are strong aggregators and value added membership where smallholders really have voice, a stake and can work directly with formal markets um, to get better prices, produce better quality, build resiliency to things like climate change. Um, and we think Walmart is uniquely positioned both using our business and our philanthropy to make that change. Thank, thank you, Julie. Uh... Let's stick to the private sector for a minute and uh, I can go to uh, Surya Kumar, uh, sorry, uh, Shiv Kumar from ITC. Uh, Shiv Kumar, ITC has, is one of the, the largest agricultural export company in India. And, um, and you've had a lot of experience working with small farms and trying to connect small farms to the market and, and also trying to build aggregation models. Can you talk to us about some of the, the constraints that you've seen in 
in trying to build these aggregation models and connecting small farms to markets. Yeah. Uh, let, let me uh, formally uh, congratulate and compliment the TCI team on launching of the, uh, the FPO database platform today. I think it's going to be extremely useful to the whole uh, set of stakeholders. Uh, you know, in terms of constraint or challenge, uh, the question that you asked, uh, the, the only thing probably I would point out is that uh, the policy framework has not kept pace uh, with the changing dynamics of the market. You know, uh, the uh, entire policy regime was broadly designed for a production driven supply chain system in a shortages economy, largely uh, based on grains. Uh, things have of course changed, but it's not kept pace. Uh, the reason why I say that, you know, from the point of view of backward uh, integration. So when we integrate backward, uh, obviously the single principle is how do we create business models that will deliver a win-win for the farmer as well as for the uh, business. Uh, let's say we do this in at, at a high level, three different uh, models. The simplest is how do we work together to reduce the transaction costs along the chain and share uh, a part of that uh, among uh, the farmer and the business. The second is uh, aligning the production with the market uh, demanded quality, uh, be it in terms of uh, traceability of the product and how it is produced and uh, certification and so on. And uh, so you fetch a premium from the consumer for the value you are delivering and plow it back uh, to farmer and uh, partake some of it in the business. The third is typically uh, you bring uh, agronomy uh, practices, bring data on what agronomy makes sense uh, for under which conditions, align availability of inputs, and then ensure that the farm productivity is higher and thereby reduce the cost and make it more competitive agriculture, expand your uh, market and thereby uh, get a, a, a larger uh, profit pool for distribution between the farmer and the business. So any of these require the production system to be far more demand responsive and work uh, in, in close proximity in the village or on the farm. And the conventional laws uh, did not allow that. So wherever states have opened up their agricultural marketing laws, so that's where uh, the companies could go and that's what we have done. Uh, of course, work with the governments to uh, really uh, create their advocacy and shape the policy and in appropriate calibrated manner, different states have done. And uh, so I would rather say that in order to work directly with the farmers, create this backward integration for creating win-win, uh, the policy has to really keep pace with the uh, market opportunity because this is a space where government will be involved uh, because there are small farmer interests, there are ecology interests. Uh, so there are going to be uh, implications on large number of uh, small traders. So given all this context of harmonization policy is going to be important. So how do you ensure that uh, that keeps evolving in a manner that uh, the sector becomes more competitive and a fair share of money goes back to the farmers and businesses find newer opportunities. So that's what I would flag as the most important constraint. Thank, thank you, Shiv Kumar. That's a really important point, bringing up the policy constraints that exist today in, in helping improve the viability of uh, FPOs and small farm agriculture in general across the country. Um, talking about policy and governments, let me go to uh, Surya Kumar from Nabad. And, you know, uh, Nabad has had a long history in promoting FPOs. In fact, when you think about FPOs in India, you think about NABAD. And, uh, and uh, you've seen successes and failures. 
and and uh, and so you've also learned quite a bit from your experience over the decades. And how would you characterize uh, successful FPOs? What 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 is it about FPOs uh, that made them successful relative to ones that were not successful and and ones that became operationally viable relative to the ones that did not? Thank you. And uh, before I answer your question, like uh, I would really congratulate for this excellent initiative of putting the data together and all the learnings together. I always, I always believe that there is a huge amount of empirical evidence is required at this point in time, when there is a huge amount of emotional exuberance about FPO. Uh, I believe like, like when you really look at the history of FPOs, I think I could call FPO a teenager in the development block, but you want the teenager to become a sumo wrestler. So the whole problem comes how the teenager has to become a sumo wrestler. Actually, as far as Nabad is concerned, we began working with this idea of FPO somewhere around 2011. And uh, the less, the like what what we think uh, has worked is whenever an FPO works with a relatively niche product, FPO has been successful. Whenever an FP, whenever an FPO has a charismatic leader or charismatic board of directors, it has worked. Whenever third thing is whenever there is a link with the market. For example, when, when there is an existing market player exists, like ITC Shivkumar, like they in turn form an FPO, their things are working fine. But when someone is working with simple thing like rice, simple thing like dal, where an existing marketing system exists, the, the, the success has not been very high. But there are some set of people around Tamil Nadu uh, where they're saying this particular rice is useful for diabetic patients. This particular rice use, is useful for lactating mothers. Then things are working. Means here, we are, whenever someone is moving from a commodity to a specific product, things started working fine. And we also had experience working with around 20 FPOs, which, which we are promoted, supported, they're into the export. All of them had very charismatic leaders. All of them had, all of them are quick learners. All of them work with specific products. Whenever these things are working, things are, they're doing well. And as I said, the expectation of FPOs is extremely high. That itself is putting a huge amount of pressure. And the reasons why things are not working is many people in the system are still not attuned to this idea of pharma aggregation. As Matthew said in his presentation, the idea of aggregation is not very unique, means it has been there since quite some time. So it takes a while for the, for the whole system to embrace this. So it will take a little more time. This is what is our experience. Uh, like I would also make an offering uh, in this platform, uh, we have a training institute in Lucknow called Bankers Institute. We, uh, Bankers Institute and GIZ Germany, we have worked to create a huge training, uh, what you call platform, uh, which we have put on their website. We have put uh, training modules which are curated, taken from several people. And we would also be interested to work with TCI to promote this idea of FPO because we very firmly believe this is the idea which could work, but then we should give it, we should give a little time to the teenager to graduate into a sumo wrestler. Thank you. I, I like that idea of teenager to sumo wrestler. That, that's exactly, it is 30 years for Prabhu. It is 30 <laughs> that years for exactly. approximately. That's, um, that's good. I think that's a vision that I'll keep in my mind for a long time. Thanks. So, thank, thank you so much for your comments and look forward to collaborating with you as we go forward look in this forward. journey.
Uh, let's come to the issue of gender because the gender has been brought up several times in this uh, discussion and Julie brought it up earlier. So I want to go to uh, the, the gender expert that I have a lot of respect for in India and that's Padmaja, um, Dr. Padmaja Ravula from Ikrasat. Padmaja has done an enormous amount of work looking at um, women and women in agriculture and nutrition. And Padmaja, you've been also looking at women's empowerment. And FBO is one of the ways in which you create empowerment for women. Um, but you find that there are very few women-led FBOs. And you know, there's some work going on, but relative to the scale, the numbers are still quite small. So what do you think are some of the constraints for bringing women more actively into organizing and leadership roles in, in FPOs? Thank you, Prabhu, for that nice question. And I think it's very relevant. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, at the outset, before I actually make my points, I would also, I felt very happy when Julie mentioned that out of the 140,000 farmers, you know, that uh, Walmart Foundation grantees have actually, have, ha are having on board 80,000 of them are women. So that's like very happy news for me, very good news for me. But that's only a, an isolated case, you know, it's not the case everywhere. So there are many challenges of why uh, women-led FPOs uh, are very few and some are very successful, like you have about 19 of them in Jharkhand, which are quite successful. We have a few in Bihar uh, through Jivika, which are quite successful, but that success you can't see it everywhere. So why, what are some of the challenges? And as a sociologist, I always keep looking at the social structure, the way people in a society live, the way people in rural communities live. And so for me, the first challenge that comes to my mind is the limiting social and cultural uh, gender norms that are existing. And these vary by geography and context, especially in India. So, so along with gender, I think we also need to look at other intersecting axes like the social group or the caste that we call the class, religion, et cetera, and how these women can actually become a part of a collective like an FPO. There have been successes with the SSG movement, but the same success you're not seeing with FPOs. And one of that would be that these strict social and cultural norms are limiting or constraining the participation of women uh, in such activities. Uh, then as the previous speaker has also said, there is not a lot of awareness about FPOs also. So I think we need to go slowly as using his same example of a teenager to a sumo wrestler, I think I would also like to say that, you know, awareness building, uh, creating that awareness, making people, especially women, know about what this aggregation would actually benefit them in what ways and how it is not just beneficial to them individually, but on a larger global scale, I think so, uh, at their own community level, at a national level, I think that's also very important. So raising awareness, that has not been done on a larger scale, maybe in limited pockets. And so I think we need to also look at that. And when I say raising the awareness, I would also like to link it to capacity building. Yes, Nabad has done a lot of capacity building, but uh, are they specific, uh, specifically tailored for women because women have certain needs. Uh, their needs are different. Men and women experience these constraints differently. So do we have these different even the training methodology may need to be different in some cases. So if, uh, if these kind of capacity development measures are initiated right from the beginning, I think then we would be having more women-led FPOs or women in male-led uh, FPOs also. Uh, a third important aspect that I would like to also mention here is why women are not coming forward to form an FPO is they have limited access to resources and productive assets. It could be inputs, it could be credit, and it could be knowledge or technology. Now let's look at technology, for example, and let's take a very simple technology, a mobile phone. Uh, in the remote villages, uh, uh, in the rural areas, 
not all women own a mobile phone in the first place and secondly uh, even if the family owns one access is very limited so it depends on who is the owner of that technology or the mobile in this case and it limits their participation it limits their access to new information and knowledge so hence maybe because that information is not there there is hesitancy to come and form groups uh, which an fpo with has a totally different and very big functions that they have to play so that could be one reason why women are not coming forward uh, and uh, with respect to knowledge also i would also like to make an interesting point here this comes out from my research on watersheds in india where i have seen that um, uh, the 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 stake all the stakeholders along the entire value chain you know uh, um, have a very different perspective of gender how do they locate gender how do they interpret gender how do they situate gender in their entire sphere of work that's very different and i think one needs to actually kind of like sensitize on these issues also that would help you know in raising the awareness levels and women let fpos becoming a reality and maybe uh, uh, there could be a lot of uh, women uh, led fpos and finally uh, my last point would be that mobility restrictions the time constraints that women have the burdens on their energy uh, and uh, the different um, um, responsibilities that have also sometimes limit the participation of women in fpos or even leading uh, fpos uh, so those are some of the points that i would like to share i have some more points but i'll come back later uh, because of the time constraint here thank you thanks thanks padma ji are really great points that you bring up um related to uh, gender and also related to disempowered communities um uh pradhan as an ngo has been doing a lot of work um especially in promoting self help groups uh for marginal communities and for women uh, based uh, self help groups across uh, india but with a particular emphasis on on eastern india and northeast india um satya uh, you've had a lot of experience in this area and um, what are some of the challenges that you see in in sustaining these groups you know it's one thing to set up an a a self help group or an fpo um but how do you keep sustaining them how do they continue to become self sufficient and and viable over the long term thanks prabhu for inviting me and uh, congratulations to tci and walmart foundation for uh, setting up and the launch of this uh, you know uh, this resource center for fpos i think that you, know, you have embarked on uh, a kind of a very uh, significant venture that is going to support uh, promoters like all of us and the you know whole stakeholders a range of stakeholders who are involved in you know fpo promotion and you know supporting fpos so uh, vis a vis your questions uh, i would like to start with saying that you know we mainly work in as you are right work in uh, the central and eastern indian uh, states featured by hilly undulating terrain and a very large proportion of uh, indigenous communities so we work with women as we believe uh, that they are the most marginalized in the intersections of uh, caste class and gender uh, yet women are the backbones of uh, smallholder farming but their contribution has been uh, quite invisibilized uh, they are not the owners uh, they are not identified as farmers uh, or they are not the decision makers in farming so that's again one kind of challenge that i am seeing the second kind of challenge is with the men migrating in search of jobs the responsibility of farming uh, has actually fallen on the women not by design but as a kind of a kind of a default option and uh, we all understand that the, the public systems are not just not aligned to support women in farming uh, by ways of credit asset subsidies because they don't have the they don't have the uh, papers for the land 
they don't have the ownership of land. So many of these are actually connected to your land ownership and your identity as a farmer. So by ways of credit, asset subsidies, extension services, direct benefit transfers, so women are continue to be there marginalized. Also, there's a great deal of problem uh, not being a farmer to access uh, minimum support price. So that is again another problem. I would also say that the, a kind of a depleted natural resource cartels farming potentials and increases the drudgery uh, on the woman uh, in terms of uh, you know dealing with uh, climate uncertainties, dealing with uh, you know food security, uh, you know dealing with uh, kind of you know uncertainties of market. So that we find that you know uh, these are certain kinds of challenges which women are currently not very you know greatly equipped with as an approach pradhan brings women at the helm uh, of the pharma producer organization as you know uh, they constitute uh, these economic collectives 100% of our members are uh, the, the the women in our fpos while the initial investment in exposure training might be slightly higher and a little more time taking, but I can also say that you know women instill the much needed institutional stability in this economic collectives, and that is most important. Uh, the problem that we also face that you know there were not too many takers for these models, and I am extremely grateful to Walmart Foundation because they have shown the kind of confidence in this model and the enthusiasm showed. Uh, to support these, you know, women collectives. And uh, now we are finding that, you know, in the mainstream, there is also a kind of a gradual acceptance of this model. And uh, we look forward to working with TCI in order to develop the pathways and uh, kind of, you know, credible pathways, develop evidences and credible pathways in order to uh, see that the women become truly emerge as, you know, leaders in the farming system. So that's something which is so I have actually, you know, said a couple of uh, couple of important challenges. You know, access to credit, access to technology. There are entry barriers in market. So you know, besides those things, uh, you know, there are significant challenges. You know, uh, that I have already mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Satya. Um, you you bring up this issue of um, access to credit, the inputs, et cetera. And some of the questions that are coming up in the chat are also alluding to that. And, and maybe um, this is something that uh, Surya Kumar may be able to address. He's got his hand up, so maybe he's going to address that anyway. Um, what, you know, uh, for FBOs to access credit has been a major constraint and they've not been able to get credit from formal lending organizations. And um, of course, NAPAT has been trying to solve this problem. Um, but what have been some of the challenges in this area? Um, two points here, one sociological point and one uh, what exactly we are doing, I'll tell. I think when we when we look at uh, when we like Padmaja was talking about comparing self-help groups and the FPOs. In the self-help groups, people came together, saved, and then there is a loan which the bank has given. So there is a quick, but they could see the thing the results quickly. In the FPO, farmers want quick results; they are not happening. And there is one more uh, underlying sociological point here. Human beings are social beings by choice. For example, in a honeybee colony, when the queen bee goes, the whole colony disappears. Human beings have arranged societies by choice. So that is really coming into the play here. So that is one aspect. As far as coming to the credit part of it, around 800 to 900 FPOs alone got the money because banks still do not understand this idea uh, we have written a guidance note, which has been, which has also been sent by the Reserve Bank of India to all the banks saying that, please look at this. The policy frame is there. Money given to FPO up to uh, five crore rupees is considered priority sector loan. That little connect is not happening because people are not coming together and presenting a larger picture to the bankers. 
so it is work in process we are constantly in touch with the banks to make this happen and the credit guarantee fund which is which is been set up hopefully would add as an incentive for people to really jump in and give loans that's what i would like to say thank you um this uh, some questions uh, i'm trying to glean from the chat and the questions and you know it's kind of there's so many things going on at the same time so i'll just pull out what i can understand from different um, messages coming through i think there is a question around successful fpos targeting a particular high market value or a, a unique commodity for example india has is probably been the most successful uh, world leader i would say uh, on the aggregation model side with dairy cooperatives dairy cooperatives in india have been in existence now i think for more than 50 years and and they continue to be very successful and and these dairy cooperatives were in existence long before the the word fpo came up and so there were some important lessons from that so is it the, is it the case that a successful fpo is only successful because it's focused on a product that is very specific and meets a very specific market need or can any crop or any agricultural enterprise be converted into an fpo and this is open to any of the panelists anyone can make a comment on that i believe uh, if it is a very niche product the probability of marketing whenever there is a connect to the market the product is acceptable in the market the probability of money coming in for the fpo the, the probability of farmers making extra money happens unless until it is a commodity is made into a product it doesn't it it works a commodity getting into a product things work fine that is what has happened in case of milk it has happened because it is a homogeneous what com uh, commodity and someone has nicely organized and distributed it prabhu if i may sorry sorry mr shivakumar please go on okay. thank you so i think in addition to the uh, speciality product angle that surya kumar talked about one other perspective that one can add is uh, at the level of aggregation of a typical size of fpo what are the incremental value that the, that can be added to the commodity Uh, if that makes sense, then FPO will be viable. Uh, let me illustrate through three different examples. Where, uh, let's say, if it is vegetable grading, it is far easier for the farmer at the time of plucking to grade them. Yeah, there is no incremental value that FPO can add, and therefore it is not necessary from that perspective that FPO makes sense. At the same time, if you look at let's say cleaning of grain it is far in any case it has to be cleaned just before milling or extraction or something and therefore it can move directly and get cleaned at a much higher order of aggregation whereas when it comes to milk and not by the conventional cooperatives i'm giving a, a different example uh, purposefully is that milk chilling in the village as opposed to the conventional bulk milling centers across an aggregation of uh, uh, villages so bulk milk uh, instead of bulk milk chilling if you do village level milk chilling through rapid milk uh, chilling equipment which is now uh, available in the last few years then it makes sense for an fpo level aggregation to add incremental value uh, and therefore share that so i think it is very important for fpos to figure out that what is the value that we can add together similar kind of thing is possible in certain kind of farm inputs that instead of all the farmers going into a nearby town uh, to get the farm inputs uh, is there a significant uh, lower cost if the fpo warehouse can stock and uh, receive so i think that that's the kind of a nature to whoever is working on the business plans 
of FPOs need to think through the, the delta value that FPOs can add, and then they can become uh, more viable. That, that's an important point. Um, yeah. the, what's the incremental value that you're bringing in? And uh, yeah. Satya, I know you want to yeah. jump into this, yeah. but, but as you do that, can I add in one more question to you? Um, so what, what I want to ask you is uh, a lot of time NGOs such as yourself, Pradhan or other civil society organizations have been instrumental in setting up the FPOs and promoting the FPOs. Um, at what point do you hand over and, and let the FPO become the owner in that in the true sense of the word and and the ngo kind of moves off and um, and and gives them you know then it uh, their fear becomes self-sustaining in a way so i want to add that to the response you were going to make anyway okay so uh, you know responding to the first question i will be brief uh, prabhu we actually uh, we actually work with a kind of an approach of a winner crop. So the winner crops are actually, you know, selected on the basis of uh, agroclimatic suitability, smallholder compatibility, as well as, you know, uh, their demand in the market. Now, there could be, uh, there could be a limited window of opportunities for smallholder farmers in the market, in the time window I'm talking, talking about. I'm saying that, you know, there could be even if these are seasonal, it is important that you know farmers actually they select three, four winner crops, and these actually now you know decidedly you know emerge in uh, different regions. So whether it is you know tomato in Jharkhand, the Karif tomato in Jharkhand, certain kinds of pulses during Ravi season in Jharkhand, or uh, in case of based on only one single crop and it's a processing activity. So we create a kind of an option uh, to ensure that if there is a kind of a round the year engagement of the farmer in the farming. And at the same time, what is also critical is that in at least 140 to 150 days of participation in the market. So how the FPO has enough of produce so that you know, they can effectively participate in the market. And that actually then you know, uh, attracts the attention of the market to the production cluster. So that is something which is extremely important. So coming to your next question, Prabhu, I would say that you know, to my understanding, this is a long haul. Uh, three to five years you know, is required uh, just to see that the FPO is coming to life and becoming uh, functional. So that is very important. And uh, while it requires attention to these details, it is extremely important to understand that the FPOs also require strong ecosystems to sustain these uh, activities. As an approach, I would say that, you know, Pradhan brings uh, women at the helm uh, of the farmer producer organizations. They, as I say that the initial time investments may be a little longer and you know slightly higher so that is something which one has to keep it in uh, consideration we need to work around the idea of building fpo alliances so a single fpo cannot just be sustained you know 300 500 thousand odd number of members you know they cannot just you know sustain there is no scale uh, there is no financial muscle to actually uh, to stay in the market so you need to build you know this fpo alliances so as to attain scale gain uh, tractions of the market and assimilate best practices. This is something also very important. And the APOs would require linkages for credit, technology, market actors, and a host of other players critical for their existence, including the government uh, to access the different kinds of entitlements. They are all smallholder farmers. They require support for irrigation, orchard, farm implements, credit on you know, fairer terms, etc. So there is a significant role of the promoting organization, Prabhu, uh, to engage in building this whole ecosystem around uh, FPOs, uh, which is so critical for their sustenance. So now this is a time-taking process, uh, as we understand. It may require anywhere between eight to 10 years to create support ecosystems for a number of FPOs that can support a large number of farmers in a particular region. So this is uh, our response. Thank you. 
comes back to going from a teenager to sumo wrestler. Takes a lot of time and effort and, and the NGO civil society community has been really helpful and, and very strong player in this process. I, I don't want to end this, we're running, we're going to run out of time soon, but I don't want to end without coming back to Padmaja and talking a bit more about the gender side of the story. Uh, Padmaja, I have a very specific question for you. Um, women's self-help groups have been enormously successful in the micro credit side of the story. And, and that's been a story that's been reflected on and written about quite a bit. Are there any lessons that we can learn from the self-help group movement around microcredit and how can we translate that to the agriculture production side? Yeah, uh, thank you. And I think uh, uh, the previous uh, panelists also referred to the SAGs and FPOs. So they are two distinct uh, collectives. So maybe they're not, you cannot compare them directly, but yes, we can take some of the lessons we have learned from the successful SAG movement to see uh, with a little bit of tweaking, with a little bit of putting it in the context, we can actually uh, use them for uh, successful FPO movements, especially women-led FPO movements. And as I said, the first and foremost, and as many of the panelists have also said, there's not enough knowledge, awareness about the FPOs uh, uh, in general. So what are these FPOs? What are the benefits of becoming or joining an FPO? So those kinds of awareness levels, which the SHG movement started and did very well, like there were a number of uh, organizations at the community level, at the uh, government level, coming and talking to women about the benefits of forming a group. And then uh, these actually helped in bringing together women, uh, 15 women together to form uh, an SHG group. So this, they invested a lot of time in first raising these awareness levels and what are the advantages of, you know, how can we build that social capital? So learning that lesson from an SSG movement of building that social capital that is required, because once that social capital is built, then the members, the actors realize that they have access to a, a lot of resources that comes from their participation in these networks, which has links to other networks as well. So the first point is awareness level and raising the, uh, the, the coming together of women, you know, that kind uh, for, uh, this FPO purpose that needs to be built. The second one is again, as I have said, capacity building and training that needs to be a, a great investment into that. Uh, the, the, the July 2020 guidelines, you know, on the 10,000 FPO scheme just mentioned, you know, uh, that there has to be at least one woman who is like a board of director. Uh, so it was like totally there was no gender lens, but then understanding it. Uh, from a, a diversity perspective is very, very essential so that you can actually see that it's not a checklist item on the agenda, but then really, you know, learn how the, the self-help groups uh, were able to come together, they were able to federate, and once the federation was formed, then you could see how these leaders, the local leaders of the SAGs were actually involved in planning, in gender budgeting, etc., and that's how their skills were also improved and thereby the agency. So that's another lesson, you know, investing in helping women, uh, involving them in the entire value chain so that they understand the nuances and the processes of right from the beginning of what an FPO means to what are the larger objectives and how it can be sustained. So that's another important point that I would like to say that involve women in all this. There have been a lot of debates saying that, you know, you can have FPOs and SLCs converge. But yes, maybe that's a good idea. And there are a lot of suggestions, especially NIRD researchers have had some suggestions and why this is a good approach. But again, we do not know whether these really will work out. So you have to be, uh, you, all, you have to tread with caution, whether this would be really a, a good opportunity or whether it will kind of like dismantle the entire infrastructure that has been built. So far, so that's something that we need to understand. And uh, um, uh, for me, according uh, to uh, another big lesson from the SFG, uh, SFGs is also that uh, these women, when they're forming an FPO, also should understand. You know, you have to make them realize 
that they have to have a common business activity which can be brought to scale. That understanding was there when the SSG movement was bought because it was mostly microcredit finance, savings and loans, uh, and that leads them to be to a mature level of SSGs. So I think that is something that we need to understand uh, and learn from the SSG movement for the FPOs, that is, how can these women find a common business activity which can be brought to scale? I think I'll stop there. Thanks. I would also Thanks. talk about governance, Thanks. et cetera, but I think that's an important point that I would like to make. Thank, thank you, Padma. That, that was really useful uh, comparison from SAGs to FPOs. I think uh, you should write a paper on that. It will be very useful for all of us to understand that. Um, thank you all in the panel for such a great discussion. Uh, and really useful information as we look forward to promoting FPOs. I'd like to give the last word to Julie now and uh, to wrap this up and, uh, and to see where, how we move forward from here. Julie, back. So first, I'd like to thank everyone. Um, I think we've seen tremendous energy from the panel with insights and um, excitement from those who are involved in chat, who are asking good questions, sharing information. I think it speaks to the power this FPO hub can have um, and the unlock that the database will bring um, as we, you know, I think we'll all be thinking about moving from teenager to sumo wrestler over the, the time, of, in the, over the coming months and years. Um, and I'm really excited about um, the role that Tata Cordell Center of Excellence FPO Hub will play in doing that. Um, and really the insights that panelists and participants in the chat brought um, that we can formalize, inspect, and really bring to the maturity as we bring, as we bring ecosystems to bear. Um, I wanna close with just three quick stories because I think they, this doesn't work if we don't bring it back to the farmers. Um, I had the privilege of spending some time in, with, on the farms recently um, and thinking about, in fact, many of these were women, a mentha farmer who was getting, who had been taught and given, able to purchase quality equipment to test what's the quality of the oil so that she knew the price she should get um, and was able to play a much more central role in sales whether it was visiting a processing plant where the FPO had really added value added processing so that they could get higher prices or whether it was going to a farm where they were starting to grow, as you said, niche crops, really mushrooms um, that could go to high-end hotels. I think these are shining lights um, that we all have seen and I am excited about how we can collaborate over time to make that more normative and have a system that really does, because in each of these cases, farmers were getting more income for their work. They were growing more year round. They had more decision rates. Women were being empowered and ultimately their livelihoods were strengthening. Um, and as we build the system, that's really the vision I'm excited about and I know is shared across. So I'm grateful for everybody joining. I'm excited about what is to come. Um, and I am hopeful about a time when FPOs really will be a sumo wrestler that are serving millions of farmers across, um, the, across India. So thank you, um, Prabhu, for all you and your team have done. Um, and thank you for pulling together this event. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. <clears throat> and thank you to the entire panel for a great uh, discussion and, um, and a great set of messages that we should be taking forward. Uh, thanks to the Walmart Foundation for supporting this work and for collaborating with us on this very important uh, project. And um, I'd like to thank my own team here uh, Matthew, Tanoj, and the entire TCI group that's been working behind the scenes. Dan, uh, who's been pulling this together from day one, 
for the enormous amount of work that's gone into this. And I hope that uh, the FBO hub will be a useful tool in, in the long term in promoting FBOs and, and, uh, and providing the, the promoters the improved uh, tools and uh, resources that they can use in their work in building capacity and sustain, sustaining um, FBOs over the long term. So thank you all very much for participation and I look forward to further interactions with all of you. Bye-bye.